in part two on Plato's Republic, we're finishing up book one, and then we're moving into book two as we're investigating the nature of justice. And at the end of book one, or part one, the video, we saw that Thrasymachus had actually started praising injustice, and he was refuted by Socrates because injustice causes states of civil war, whether that's among a group or even within a single person. So in contrast to that, Socrates actually proposes a positive thesis about justice, and in doing so, the concept of function is introduced. And so broadly speaking, we can identify functions in certain ways. The function of an item, of a thing, of a person, of an X, is what can only be done with that thing or best done with that thing. Speaking generically here, we can put anything obviously into the variable of X. So having a function at all implies having a virtue. If you perform the function well, you are virtuous. And this could apply to scissors or chainsaws. If, if they scissors cut paper well, that's the virtue because cutting paper is the function of scissors. And likewise with chainsaws, cutting trees. And so when it comes to justice, obviously this applies to people and justice is the virtue of the soul performing its function well so when somebody has a soul performing well it is a just soul and the just person must be happier than the unjust because their soul is functioning well so if the soul is to function well and, of course, be happy, then it must be virtuous and just. And so we shouldn't praise injustice. Justice is something that is good for us as an individual person. Now, at this point, even though we have this positive claim of Socrates, Thrasymachus has now been refuted because we see that justice is actually good for a person. But Socrates says at this point, I still don't know anything after our discussion. He claims to have not gained insight about the nature of justice at this point. So they seem to learn something about justice and primarily what it is not, uh, but they don't have a good grasp on the nature of justice. And that's how book one ends with this concern that we really don't have a grip on what justice is yet, but we have introduced this key concept of function. And that's going to play an important role with fleshing out what justice is. So we turn over the pages to book two and there's a new approach in book two. So Glaucon, one of Socrates' friends and one who does want to explore the nature of justice sincerely, he asks, well, if justice is a good, and we all seem to agree on that now, now that Thrasymachus has been refuted, where, what kind of good is justice? What category of good does justice belong? And he identifies three different possible categories of things that are good. Things that are good would fall into one of these three categories. We have those things that are sought for their own sake and not for the consequences that they bring about. So this would be harmless pleasures, maybe uh, watching a kitten video or uh, popping bubble wrap or something like that. It's enjoyable, uh, but it, and it's done for its own sake. You're not trying to accomplish anything else or bring about some other good as a result. So that's one way that something could be good bringing pleasure. Another way that something could be good, or another category, is those things sought for their own sake and also for the consequences they bring about. So some things that we enjoy doing also bring about good consequences. Being able to see is something that is 
enjoyable. Seeing clearly is enjoyable, and obviously that helps us get around. Same with hearing, hearing music being played, for example, hearing the voice of a loved one, and so on. We enjoy hearing for its own sake and the consequences brought about. Uh, speaking for myself, and, and of course this is true for most of us, eating fruit is something that is pleasurable, enjoyable, and generally speaking, uh, to our benefit, something that is healthy. Okay, so one category, pleasure sought for its own sake, not for its consequences. Second category, for its own sake and for consequences. Well, what else is left if something is good would be those things sought for the consequences they bring about, but not for their own sake. So these would be things that don't seem to be pleasurable in themselves. For example, for me at least, eating vegetables. For most vegetables, it's not like I enjoy the flavor, but I eat them because they are nutritious. I eat them for the consequence. This would be the case for, for medicines. If it's a, an oral liquid, for example, or getting a, an injection of some kind of medicine, getting a flu shot or another kind of vaccination, those kinds of things. You don't enjoy the experience of doing those things, but you do it for the consequences that are brought about. So Glaucon has raised the question, okay, if justice is a good, it has to belong into one of these three categories. Now, Glaucon then says, look, it's pretty clear to me that justice belongs in that third category. You don't do it for its own sake because of it's pleasurable. It, you do it because of the consequences. And the majority of people view justice in, in this way. And they have good reasons to do so. So Glaucon considers somebody who's completely unjust, but somehow considered by everyone outside to be a just person. And that individual we will be able to use others to his advantage, will be able to maintain a high reputation. People mistakenly view the person as just, even though he's not. He'll be much better off, it seems, than the person who's in the opposite situation of being a just person, but considered to be unjust. The just person, but somebody has maligned his reputation and lied about this individual and has a bad reputation because of those lies that seems like a kind of miserable situation to be in. And so it seems to be that you would be better off to be unjust, but considered just. And Glaucon goes on to support this thesis by telling a story. And the story is about the ring of Gyges, or uh, rather a, an ancestor of Gyges, and, and probably this would have been pronounced Gyges, but uh, in any case, we typically say Gyges. And the story is this. He, there's a shepherd out in the field. There's an earthquake, opens up a chasm. He goes into it, and he finds a ring on a corpse. And he puts the ring on his own finger and then goes about his business. And he goes to a meeting. And at the meeting, he realizes as he's kind of playing with the ring that as it turns inward, people thought he wasn't there. He had become invisible. And then he could turn it outward again and he became visible again. And as soon as he realized this, it's a very quick part of the story, he seduced the queen, killed the king, and became the king of the land and obviously used this capacity for invisibility to his own good, but it was a corrupt way that he was gaining power. So, sound familiar, right? This would, it, like the Lord of the Rings, that's what the ring does to most people. Uh, it's the story of the Invisible Man from H.G. Wells. You have the capacity for invisibility causing someone to be very much an unjust person. And Glacon says, this is what everyone would do. You know, if, everyone, if anyone had the power of invisibility, that's what they would go do. They'd go steal things, manipulate other people, uh, seduce people, uh, whatever, to, to their own advantage. And so the story that he provides is that they complain, they support the claim that we've suggested that justice belongs in that third category. 
it's sought for the consequences so that other people will treat you well, but certainly not for its own sake. And as soon as you can have the consequences without actually being just, that's what a person chooses. And so only the frail or old people or otherwise limited people sincerely claim that justice should reign, the ones who are disadvantaged. They want justice, but Clark Hahn says, you know, if you have power, uh, you don't really need justice. You just need the reputation of it. And this is a, a position that I think Nietzsche in various places is suggesting, certainly he does in the genealogy of morals, uh, that this is why justice seems to be valued among people. So wealth and power acquired by injustice is going to be able to buy off the negative effects of the injustice. So Glaucon, though he's on Socrates' side, though he wants to see the argument that proposes that justice belongs in that second category, sought for its own sake and for its consequences, is really concerned that it only belongs to that third category. And maybe it seems Thrasymachus might be right after all. Okay, so Socrates needs to respond, obviously, but in order to do so, Socrates says, you know, just like a sign that's in a distance and you have to get up closer in order to read it well, sometimes we need to see things uh, more up close, or if they were just larger, then it would be easier to see. So um, elderly people sometimes have, you know, large print magazines or Bibles or things like that, and that way you can read them more easily. And so Socrates decides they need to consider what justice is like by writing justice largely. And what does that mean? That means considering what justice would be like in a city-state. So this is the plan. Instead of talking about an individual now, we move to think about what justice would be in an ideal state. So that project begins here in book two. And one of the things that is developed very quickly, so he starts talking about, okay, you have a group of people, how are they going to get along and function the best? Well, specialization seems to be reasonable. So you have some people who till the land and gather the food. You have other people who are skilled in cooking the food. You have other people who are skilled in making houses. There are other people who are skilled in making clothing. And, and you cooperate with one another and, and barter or trade or develop a system of monetary uh, exchange if you can. And obviously the, the state go is going to function better if you have people who are specializing and they can really do their thing well, instead of everybody off on their own, make, growing, making, cooking their own food, making their own house, making their own clothes, all of that, it works better if we all cooperate. So the ideal state is going to have three broad groups of people speaking big and generally. There are going to be the craftsmen, which was mostly the types of tasks that I was just describing, like growing food, making things. There are going to be soldiers and guardians. They are going to need it, be needed to protect the city-state from being attacked from outside, and they might be needed to also secure more land for, the, for goods when people want more goods. And you need rulers. You need people in place who are going to direct the affairs of the state. And so now we have people who belong in each of these individual categories, and this is discussed much more carefully as we proceed through the Republic. Now, just to wrap up one difference here in discussions of virtue so far between Socrates and the Socratic dialogues and what we see in the Protagoras, when we talked about virtue there, it's unified in wisdom. We especially saw this argument well displayed in the Protagoras, but we also saw it in the Mino. And we saw that wisdom is the key to virtue. This is something I call the Socratic doctrine, or rather uh, the authors of a text that I commonly use, Cohen, Kurd, and Reeve often call this 
a Socratic doctrine, right? That, that you have uh, this idea that virtue and wisdom are intimately connected and maybe even one and the same. However, now we see in the Republic, what we're going to do is that virtues are going to correspond with functions. And that's going to be functions of people in an ideal state. And it's also going to be function related to the parts of a soul of an individual that we'll have to explore. So justice in the individual is going to be the right ordering of the parts of the soul. And very quickly here, we have three parts of the soul according to Socrates and Plato. We have the part that does our reasoning. We have the emotional parts, often called the spirited part. And we have appetites, the senses and appetites together, things that we desire. And so when these things are properly ordered in an individual, that's going to be a just individual. So we're going to have to explore this uh, much more carefully when we look at an ideal state and see justice there and then how that's going to apply on an individual level. So there's our brief overview of the remaining of the Republic.